Both during and immediately following the release of Call of Duty Ghosts in 2013, the industry was in the middle of drastic changes. With the release of the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One, games could be invaded further than what players had seen before. Many franchises turned to expanding their reach with open worlds and new mechanics. For Call of Duty, this meant the introduction of advanced movement. First out of the gate was Advanced Warfare, helmed by the newly promoted Sledgehammer Games. While the former Infinity War devs at Respawn were trading similar ground with Titanfall and Bungie had their own new sci-fi shooter out, Call of Duty was widely thought of first when advanced movement was thought of in the FPS space. While Advanced Warfare was a moderate success with players and critics, Treyarch's Black Ops 3 had the cachet of a recognizable brand within a brand to sell extra copies, making it a huge seller. With the advanced movement craze having devoured the FPS space the last two years, people cautiously waited to see what Infinity War would present for their latest entry in the series. To say Ghosts hadn't been received very well is a bit of an understatement. While it kept some players busy in the early days of the new console generation, its lackluster campaign and underwhelming multiplayer quickly put the game at the bottom of many people's lists when it came to Call of Duty. But leaving off the story on a massive cliffhanger made many people believe that a sequel to Ghosts was inevitable. Well, to put it bluntly, there ain't gonna be any ghosts. The world got its answer in May of 2016. Instead of following up the hanging plot threads and taking the series back to boots on the ground, Infinity Ward would now be following industry trends instead of creating them. This rubbed many people the wrong way, as after only two years, many were tired of the advanced movement and wanted more variety from the series. Not to mention that aside from advanced movement, the game would also take place in space. It had long been joked that when Call of Duty ran out of ideas, they would totally jump the shark and leave the franchise's roots behind altogether and turn into a space game. So you can see why people weren't exactly excited by the idea of what this entry had in store. The reveal trailer on YouTube was disliked so much that for a time it became YouTube's highest downvoted video until YouTube ended up pulling off that feat themselves. <laughs> oh, that's hot. That's hot. So if you ask anyone about Infinite Warfare today, you're most likely going to get a mixed to negative reaction. It was one step too far in a franchise and even an industry that had become oversaturated in a certain gameplay style. Not to mention that it was coming from a studio that had fallen out of favor once most of their original talent jumped ship. Not only would the multiplayer be more of the same from the prior two years, but Infinity Ward had lost their original identity so much that they finally gave in and put in a zombie mode. While they had tried to innovate with the idea with Extinction and Ghosts, those that remembered what the team used to have been capable of were let down by just how far they had fallen. Ask anyone about Infinite Warfare today and you'll most likely get an answer about how the game was another failure in a dark period for Call of Duty. And yet, while I don't like the zombies mode and haven't put more than an hour into the multiplayer, there is a redeeming factor to be found with this game. While it's far from perfect, the campaign is a bright spot in an otherwise black sky of mediocrity for both this game and the era it was released in. While Ghost's campaign is bad, it at least gave Infinity Ward a good lesson to learn from, as it's clear that their time and energy in the campaign was well spent, and they mostly learned from what Ghost did wrong. While we'll get into what the game does wrong, it's clear that they shot for the stars on this one, and I'm happy to say that it mostly sticks to landing. Our story begins sometime many years in the future. The human race has left Earth and spread out across the solar system, placing colonies and mining them for resources. One of these colonies on Mars has now grown large enough that it feels it can be separate from Earth entirely. The Settlement Defense Front, or SDF, is now so radicalized in this thinking that they want to declare war on Earth itself. And here we go with our first problem right out of the gate. Like the Federation before them, the SDF's goals and motivations aren't fleshed out enough to make them interesting villains. It's not even worth repeating that they're not effective villains for the most part because the complaints I had about the Federation and Ghosts can be applied here as well. They seem to be just evil for evil's sake. There's never a good reason given for why they want to be separate from Earth. And not only do they want to be separate from Earth, they want to destroy Earth full sail. This makes no sense whatsoever. Sure, destroy the one planet solar system hospitable for human life without any major terraforming efforts. That's a great plan. If the SDF just wanted to take over the planet and rule it as they see fit, that would be fine. If I were born on Mars, I'd probably be jealous of people that got to grow up on Earth too. That would totally make sense for a villain's motivation. But, like the Federation, all the SDF really seems to care about is simply destroying everything they can just because, which makes them underwhelming villains. That being said, I still think they're more effective than the Federation in being intimidating villains, but that partly has to do with how our heroes are written. So with the SDF encroaching on territory claimed by the United Nations Space Alliance, a special squad of Special Combat Air Recon Troopers, or SCARs, are sent into a black site that recently went dark. The site was making experimental weaponry and has been blatantly attacked by the SDF. The SCARs go in and scuttle the base to make sure the SDF can't claim any of the prototype technology but get caught in the explosion. 
Wounded and leaking oxygen, they're soon at the mercy of the SDF and their commander, Admiral Koch. If he looks familiar to you, that's because he's played by Kit Harrington of Game of Thrones fame. Now, do you remember when I said this a few videos ago? It feels a little odd that these big names are attached to these pretty basic characters, but Call of Duty has always been wonky with how they use their celebrity talent. But that's a tirade for another day, though. Well, that day is today. Unlike their sister studios, Infinity Ward doesn't really understand how to utilize their celebrity talent very well. Treyarch has made good use of actors such as Gary Oldman, Michael Rooker, and Tony Todd in the Black Ops games. Meanwhile, Sledgehammer utilized Kevin Spacey well in Advanced Warfare by casting him as the villain, which has honestly helped that inclusion age better than it probably should have. Infinity Ward, meanwhile, has gotten their own big-name talent to appear in these games and has squandered their use after Modern Warfare 2. Four heavy hitters featured in Modern Warfare 3, but given that that was the end of the trilogy, their characters couldn't be utilized in a fashion that took away from the pre-existing ones, and so not much was done with them. Ghost had an opportunity to do this better, but bad direction and poor writing helped kill any gravitas the known names could have brought to their roles. While Infinite Warfare does use John Marshall Jones well in his role as Admiral Reigns, the bigger name here is clearly Kit Harington. Naturally, his face was plastered all over the marketing for the game, as Game of Thrones was still popular at the time. However, for people wanting to see a more recognizable face in the game or a compelling villain, well, you're out of luck. In 2016, Koch has barely more screen time and influence on the game than Khaled al-Assad did in Modern Warfare 1. And the moments where he is on screen is just routine villain stuff. See? There he goes killing his own underlings to show that he doesn't care. Koch then commands the scars to be executed as he dramatically walks away. Thankfully, while the villains are overall a pretty generic bunch, we now get introduced to our protagonists. Turns out that mission was footage that was being viewed at UNSA headquarters in Geneva back on Earth. Lieutenant Nick Reyes takes it in as Admiral Reigns gives him the rundown on the situation. This is a deliberate act of aggression, Admiral. We should be out there on patrol, not down here throwing confetti. The rules of engagement prohibit definitive action under these circumstances. So we stand by with our barrels in the sand and we watch a Fleet Week parade? Lieutenant Reyes, make no mistake. My instincts, which are aligned indelibly with your own, are that we need to engage. Why don't we, sir? If Reyes sounds familiar to you, that's because he's voiced by Brian Bloom, who is no stranger to voice acting in Call of Duty games. He was the voice of Keegan in Ghosts, Watch and learn, kid. the voice of several extras in Modern Warfare 2 and 3, and, well, you probably recognize this one. TACTICAL NUKE INCOMING! And already, Infinite Warfare is a step above Ghosts in its storytelling. One of the things that dragged Ghosts down was the moody, pre-teen goth phase cutscenes. While they fit the tone of what the game was going for, they were counteractive in helping you identify with the characters, and most of the moments where they tried to connect you to them were short-lived in an engine. Here, Infinity Ward has finally caught up with Treyarch and Sledgehammer by utilizing pre-rendered mocap cutscenes. Thanks to these, we can actually see the emotions on the faces of the characters as they interact. That goes a long way in helping us get attached to these characters and believing that they're real. So while the SDF appears to be on the offensive, the UNSA is forced to sit back while their Fleet Week celebrations happen. And might I say, this game is really good looking. The muted, earthy tones of ghosts have not aged as well graphically thanks to the game being split between two different console generations. Not to mention the post-apocalyptic rundown style was even a little old when it released, which is the same year The Last of Us was. Well, you know, the first time. While the game doesn't have neon colors or anything, the environments all pop and look really good now that Call of Duty is firmly on the at-the-time current-gen hardware, and off of the 360 and PS3. The scale is also impressive. As Reyes and his fellow Lieutenant Nora Salter walk across the roof to a landing pad, you can see the giant ships flying by overhead. As a sci-fi nut, this is all really cool, and I'm immediately more interested in learning more about this world timeline than I was with Ghosts. While this is still far removed from what I think Call of Duty should stick with, it's all being handled pretty well. And if you couldn't already tell, the writing this time around is a step up from Ghosts in terms of character interactions. This is also probably due to how well it's acted out. As I mentioned earlier, mocap was used in the cutscenes, so I wouldn't be surprised if they also did group recording sessions as well. This would be different from Ghosts or the Modern Warfare games, where recordings were most likely all done separately. This means the voice actor is in charge of making sure everyone is on the same page so things don't sound off. And speaking of characters, this brings us to everyone's favorite part of the game, Ethan. What the hell is that? I think we found E3N. Indeed, sir. Petty Officer First Class, E3N. And has tactical humanoid, third revision. That's a mouthful. You ain't kidding. Call me Ethan, ma'am. Ethan is hands down the best character in the game. Between his writing, the vocal performance, and the animations on his head, Infinity Ward manages to take an emotionless robot and turn him into the most human character in the game. Ethan is so easy to like that despite him being in the game a lot, I wish we had more of him. And really, that can be said for most of the characters. While not every character is given a deep history and their own motivations like the crew interactions in Mass Effect, having Reyes interact with all these various characters between and during missions helps the crew feel more like a family than the actual family from Ghosts. 
The likability of the characters is something that really hurt Ghost, as there was never one character the players were able to latch onto, with maybe the exception of Riley, but he's a dog, so that's pretty easy. Infinite Warfare thankfully goes back to the early Modern Warfare days by giving us charismatic characters to get accustomed to aside from our main leads. We'll talk about some of them more later on, but for now, the SDF is attacking Geneva. With their ride shot down, Reyes, Salter, Ethan, and Admiral Reigns fight their way through the streets. It's here that we see some stark differences in this game compared to others, in that the time to kill in this campaign is really slow. Now, time to kill in the multiplayer is an often debated topic, but it's never really brought up in the campaigns at all. I don't know if making it slow in Infinite Warfare was deliberate, but I'm not sure how I feel about it. Many of the weapons still use traditional bullets. With these, many enemies are harder to kill as their spacesuits take a lot of damage, which makes sense considering they have to protect a user from the vacuum of space. Some weapons, though, are energy-based, meaning they shoot lasers. These will quickly shred enemies and get the TTK back down to traditional times, making projectile weapons almost entirely useless in the campaign. While the ability to choose a weapon loadout for your missions returns from Black Ops 2 and 3, I'd often end up switching to an energy weapon just so I could kill enemies faster. But aside from the slower combat, these early missions are a blast to play and keep the pacings flowing throughout. Getting to play and witness a Pearl Harbor slash 9-11 surprise attack always helps us root for our characters, and despite being sci-fi, keeping the entire opening on the ground level helps keep the experience relatable and not over the top like the intro to Ghosts. The moment where a ship crashes and sends a giant dust cloud into the air is especially harrowing as the visual illusion to after the Twin Towers fell is obvious. So after the group retakes the anti-air defense system from the SDF, it's time to get into space and turn the tide. This brings us to the Jackal missions, which are dogfighting segments that are perfectly serviceable. The hold down to lock on and autopilot engage system makes the gameplay pretty easy on lower difficulties and it gets repetitive fast. I'll come back to that in a moment though. So if most of the SDF fleet destroyed along with most of Earth's, there's now only two UNSA ships left. They are now responsible for protecting Earth while it rebuilds its fleet and thanks to the death of the Captain of the Retribution, Lieutenant Reyes is now Commander Reyes and the acting captain. His first mission is to retake the dockyards on the moon, which are instrumental in getting raw materials to Earth from its colonies in the solar system. This means a ground assault, led by Staff Sergeant Omar and his Marines. Between moments of fighting through both the terminal and out in space, the combat is actually aided by the use of the Boost Rig's advanced movement system. Being able to jump around onto ledges and stuff as you engage the enemy in both gravity and zero-g is actually pretty fun. While Modern Warfare 2 teased the idea of going to space and Ghost had a little bit of that, neither is as fully realized as it is here. The space combat in Ghost isn't really any different from the underwater combat, it's just that one is underwater and the other is in space. Infinite Warfare, however, allows the player to move in 360 degrees along the Y-axis, really living up to the there's no up or down in space mindset. This gives combat a new edge to it, and I think I would have preferred more segments like this over some of the Jackal missions later. So with the SDF driven away from Earth for now, it's now time to take the fight to the SDF and send the pacing of this game crashing into a brick wall. The biggest issue with this campaign is that it has no middle chapter. It has a great beginning, and it has a great end, but the middle of this game isn't really a middle so much as it's just a series of Spec Ops missions thrown in for funsies. While Black Ops 2 had a similar system in its campaign, it still had a regular three-act story structure, and the smaller missions had relevance to the plot given that they impacted how the story moved forward. Here, you only have to do one or two before the next story mission can be accessed, and the rest can be skipped. I'm guessing, anyway. I completed all the optional missions on the map to fill a compulsive need to check all the boxes off. I'm sure you're required to do some of them before all the story missions are locked, but the way I did it, I played through all of them before advancing forward in the main story, which severely impacted the pacing. And since these missions don't seem to have a major impact on the story, it might just be best to skip most of them anyway. If you only do enough required to move on, then it helps keep things from being too repetitive like Jackal missions. Plus, most of the infiltration missions are on copy-paste FDS destroyers, which means you're visiting the same locations over and over and over again. Not only does this feel very repetitive, but the destroyers aren't really designed with the advanced movement in mind, so the game isn't really playing to the strength of the gimmick it's supposed to be using. On one hand, I suppose for those tired of advanced movement at the time, that's actually kind of okay. But it's still supposed to be a major component of the game, so not designing the game around it very well is still an issue. Another weird thing about these missions is when you realize that the entire game takes place in a single day. Yes, you heard that right. From start to finish, only a little over 24 hours pass. This makes the pacing feel completely off once you realize this, as despite faster than light travel, it doesn't seem plausible that you're doing all of this in one day. And on top of that, the really well done cutscenes just stop and are replaced with the old briefing cutscenes instead. So not only is the pacing all out of whack, not only does the game become repetitive as all heck, but the charming and fun characters we had gotten to know aren't being utilized well either. It makes these missions feel tacked on and like a last minute replacement for larger levels that they couldn't get done in time. Now to maybe make up for this, the story levels that you do eventually get back to are a little longer than in prior games, giving you plenty of character interactions to maybe make up for the ones you've been missing during the optional missions. 
And to just prove how well the character writing is handled, the game just drops a stellar cutscene out of nowhere. Captain, your suit. Took a hit in the cockpit. Left arm's torn. Unsettling report, sir. Oxygen depleted. Captain, I can't stop it. What do I do? Let it go, Ethan. I can't, sir. You're my commanding officer, Captain. My mission is you. Who says? I'm hardware, sir. Ultimately expendable. Oh, no. You're my brother, Ethan. You're talking robot, brother. Affirmative. Yes. Well, I have the hands of one, sir. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> Looks like this is the end of the line, partner. I think I'm scared, sir. Me too. The little movements on Ethan's visor are just so good and go a long way of giving the robot without a face so much personality. You can feel that he's feeling things. Captain, please, I can look after myself. Ethan, go to engineering, see Mac, get a clean bill. What about you, sir? Don't you worry about me. Try and stop me, sir. So while Nick is saved from suffocating at the last possible second, he doesn't get time to rest as we head off to our next mission. The SDF has sent a mining asteroid near Mercury off its axis and is slowly spinning towards the sun. What follows is an honestly kind of terrifying mission as the crew is forced to wait for the sun to disappear before going outside, on top of being attacked by killer robots that only operate when the station is in day mode, creating an eerie game of red light green light as the sun comes and goes every few minutes. Honestly, this is done well enough that this should have been Infinity Ward's take on the zombies mode for this game. Call it robot zombies and have all waves be on a timer. If they're not all dead when the night cycle starts, then that gives you time to resupply or knock them down while they're defenseless so they can't join the next wave. But anyway, while the civilians are saved, it comes at the cost of Staff Sergeant Omar and we get another moment to ruminate on the main theme of this game. Gave you a direct order! I'm the pilot of this ship. It's my job to make sure that we get back. We lift off on my order! We shouldn't have been down there in the first place. That's not your call. Mission comes first. Omar's words, not mine. I bring my men home, Salt. We do both. Captain's duty is to get his men home alive, Staff Sergeant. No ways, Lieutenant. No ways. Look, the strength of the pack is in all the wolves. Captain, all in, no matter the cost. They were ready. Now, if you don't have the will to make that kind of choice, then like me, you have no place being in command. I couldn't ram my own ship. I would have killed them. They came to win. This doesn't look like victory. I think another reason this game fares better than Ghost despite its faults is that it's actually trying to say something. What message did ghosts have? They didn't have anything to say about modern war, or how you should be careful to trust who's leading you, or that one man can change the course of history. It could have gone for a family is stronger than anything type message, but by the end, one of the many reasons Ghosts fails as a story is because it's not about anything. Throughout Infinite Warfare, when it's not getting us to do busy work, we see Rey as constantly confronted with the reality of being in command. While he held a high rank prior to being Captain of the Retribution, it was of a smaller squad of soldiers, helping things feel more closed off. Casualties were unacceptable, and the safety of the team should come first. But as many have to tell him as the game goes on, that's unfortunately not the reality of war, and I love the moment where you can see that really sink in for him. But even with Omar gone, the fight continues, and after the crew realizes that they're now the only ship left in the fight, they come up with a plan to take out Admiral Koch. As it turns out, the reason that Aedis fired on the UNSA fleet is because an SDF sleeper agent hacked into them. His plan was to blow up the entire facility and him along with it, which would then send an all-clear signal to the rest of the SDF fleet to invade Earth now that the defenses were down. Learning this, Reyes plans to use the transponder inside the sleeper agent to trigger a false all-clear and lure the SDF in while the ADIS is still fully functioning and blow them out of the sky. It's a good plan, but it unfortunately doesn't work at all. The sleeper agent escapes captivity, hacks into the ADIS, and blows them up, and then destroys the beacon inside him to trigger the all-clear. Koch's ship, the Olympus Mons, then destroys the UNSA headquarters building, killing Admiral Reigns in the process. Thankfully, Reyes has a contingency plan in place and has the Retribution jump into orbit out of light speed just above the Olympus Mons. The resulting shockwave temporarily disables the ship and allows the crew of the Retribution to board it. Once inside, they hack all the drones on board, Reyes detonates one to kill everyone on the bridge. Then the player has the option to listen to Koch give a speech about how evil he is and how Mars will win in the end, or just kill him. I chose to just kill him. Captain has the card. 
With the Olympus Mons and her weaponry under UNSA control, the crew jumps to Mars and starts wrecking shop. After seeing what the ship was capable of earlier, it's satisfying to get to turn her weapons against the faction that built her for conquest. Pretty soon, though, the SDF figures out what's going on and manages to shoot down both the Olympus Mons and the Retribution. Crash landing on Mars, Reyes comes across one of the Marines that had accompanied him on a few missions. While another character runs to find a med pack, Reyes is forced to try and render first aid as the Marine bleeds out. Just watching this scene isn't enough, as this is something that needs to be played to truly be experienced. As Reyes places his hands on the shoulder's chest to apply aid to the wound, you can feel his heartbeat through the vibrations in the controller. As the seconds tick by, you can feel the heartbeat grow fainter and fainter as the Marine dies. This, in my mind, is one of the greatest moments in any Call of Duty game. The brilliant simplicity of just being able to feel the heartbeat through the rumble in the controller is one of those things that help video games stand out as its own unique art form. Despite only knowing this soldier for a short time, feeling the life fade out of him through my own hands made me emotional and I had to pause the game and take a breath the first time I played this in 2016. Despite its pacing issues and other sore spots, it's moments like this that makes you realize that Infinite Warfare's campaign is actually inspired, and I wish that it hadn't been saddled with the Call of Duty brand. If Infinity Ward were to expand on this and essentially make a first-person Mass Effect, this would be a new hit franchise. And while I'm at risk of ruffling feathers here, it's moments like these that make me like Infinite Warfare's campaign more than Titanfall 2's. Yes, I said it. Titanfall 2 has a great campaign with fantastic level design, but I couldn't help but feel that Respawn was handcuffed a little bit and couldn't go all the way to really make the game they wanted. And considering EA sent it out to die in between the releases of Battlefield 1 and Infinite Warfare, it seems clear that they didn't realize what they had on their hands with that game. It's even ironic that both Infinite Warfare and Titanfall 2 share some similar plot elements and there's so much crossover between the teams. If I had a nickel for every time a futuristic FPS game came out in the fall of 2016 that featured advanced movement and our playable human character becomes friends with a charismatic robot, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? And yes, I know I used that joke already. Sue me. But like Titanfall 2, Infinite Warfare doesn't quite live up to its potential either as we're in the endgame now. Like I said, I would gladly take another 10 hours of these characters as they're just that darn charismatic. Robot Army reporting for duty, sir. He hacked the Olympus bus. How many did you get? Full company, sir. I mean, they're idiots, but they can fight. Good work, Metal One. Touchdown and get ready to go. Nice, sir. What's left of the Retribution now has one mission left, destroying the SDF shipyards. Without them, they won't be able to attack Earth while it rebuilds its own fleet. The plan is to commandeer a ship and use it to destroy the shipyards, and this kicks off the Rogue One Everyone Dies montage. It's good to be in a fight with you, sir. Get down, sir! Even Reyes orders the commandeered ship to fire in his position, and he has his breath taken away. Quite literally. Out of hundreds of crew on board the Retribution, only four survive the destruction of the SDF shipyards. The game then ends with Salter giving her peace to the Fallen, content with the knowledge that those who died, died saving Earth. And so we end a flawed, but still solid campaign. Despite the pacing issues, when the story finally gets going again, you really don't notice those issues at all as it sucks you back in. While it wastes its main villain, it brings enough new to the table to help make this game stand out compared to other Call of Duty games, even the other two with advanced movement. Also, being set on a spaceship, the game technically has a naval focus, which is the only time in the series history I can think of that happening. Going into this, I really only remembered the issues with the middle of the game and kind of had logged this in my memory as a failed experiment much like Ghosts. I was so happy to be pleasantly surprised that this wasn't the case and I'd forgotten about the genuinely well done moments this game had to offer. While as an overall package, I think Infinite Warfare is still a dark spot on the Call of Duty brand thanks to its poor multiplayer and zombies output, the campaign is good enough it almost needs to be considered as its own separate thing because of how good it surprisingly is. While it has more trouble spots in it than the Modern Warfare trilogy, it's such a step up from Ghosts on just a storytelling standpoint, not to mention the presentation, that it's honestly hard to believe that both games came from the same studio. But really, they didn't. After Ghosts, some talent slowly started trickling back to Infinity Ward. Some of them were from other studios like Naughty Dog, 
but others were original members of the team that had abandoned ship in 2010. You can tell there's actual talent behind the scenes this time, even if it didn't totally work out for them. And I have to give it up to Brian Bloom, as not only did he voice Nick Reyes, as he's mostly known as a voice actor, but he also wrote the game. You know, this is another kind of central tenet uh, to what we're doing when we come out here and we shoot these scenes, when we write these scenes. So while an imperfect game in many respects, there's still a lot to like about it. If anything, it taught the team valuable lessons. So with lessons learned for their next game, maybe in order to make something new, it was time to revisit something old. As even more former Infinity Ward employees made their way back to the company in the following years, maybe it's time to say hello again to some other old friends and familiar faces.